you, you know, you know, the best part of being the moderator is that you know that the right place to sit is wherever you will not be sitting on somebody else's there, lap. There so go. it's definitely, it's definitely going to be the last. I one feel out. it's like Oprah, and everyone yeah. should get keys to the yeah, car. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. So, as my Atlantic colleagues can attest. Uh, we have been in dozens of cities over the last few years, talking to mayors, talking to community groups, and everywhere we go, we hear pretty much the same story, which is that the good news is that cities are growing again, adding population, adding jobs, reestablishing themselves as centers of uh, economic dynamism and innovation. Uh, your temporary predecessor, Tim Burgess, when we did an event in Seattle, told us that Seattle now has the best economy since the Yukon Gold Rush. Yeah. Um, the other side, though, is that everywhere we go, we hear the same concern, which is that we are not equipping our own kids from low-income and minority neighborhoods, in many cases, to compete for the jobs that we are creating. So I'd like to start by asking each of you about both ends of that equation. What is allowing cities to grow again? And what will it take to connect those opportunities to more of your own residents? Mayor Carter, maybe start us off. Yeah, I think it's an important question. Uh, you're right, cities are growing. Cities are, uh, I think, more as relevant as ever. In St. Paul, we're experiencing uh, an incredible uh, kind of housing, uh, an incredible population growth. We're nearing our all-time high population wow. with a whole generation of projected growth ahead. That, of course, creates challenges because that means that's thousands more people in our community who will need you know, uh, schools and libraries and recreation centers and police officers and ambulances and equipping our city for that future is critical. At the same time, our city has switched from the city I grew up in, which was about 80% white, uh, to a city that has about half people of color in it uh, as our population grows and our demographics change. That creates new challenges for us uh, within our schools, within our neighborhoods, in terms of kind of providing the type of housing that we have. Uh, one of our challenges and one of the strategies that we're kind of really uh, looking to uh, is finding new ways to engage people in the process of governance uh, with the notion uh, our line is, we're talking always about building a city that works for all of us uh, and that requires all of us to do some of the building. Uh, and so preparing all of our children mm -hmm. for success requires finding way, new ways for people in our communities to, um, to, to, to speak up and to have a voice in what that success should look like and what our ambitions for our children should be. Mayor Durkin, I mean, certainly Seattle is at the epicenter of the digital transformation. The, the opportunity there is enormous, but the challenges that come with that are also substantial. It's really challenging because, you know, we <clears throat> in Seattle, our cost of living has grown almost 70% in four years. Our, our entry level house is $725,000. Think of that. Um, and so we've got this job growth that's unbelievable. If you look out in the future, they think there's about 700,000 jobs in the next five years that will be created in the Puget Sound area. But most of those jobs require some post high school college education certificate degree or training. And only about 30% of our kids in the region are getting it. So mm. we're really trying to push on that. And so we have a, something on the ballot next week. It's a levy that the city of Seattle mm. is sponsoring to add to the school district because it's separate. And we will almost double the amount of free preschool for families, mostly disadvantaged more money to close the opportunity gap, and then for every kid who graduates, two years free college with navigators and supports to come over the other barriers to try to marry that up with what employers need. So we're going to employers saying, okay, we know all these jobs have been placed on top of Seattle and not enough of our particularly communities of color have joined that updraft. Mm -hmm. And so really focusing on those educational opportunities from pre-K through two years of college. I'm back to talk about that more in a few minutes. Mayor Duggan? Well, it's, it's the fundamental question. We have a slightly different uh, problem than Seattle has. Uh, but, mm. you know, we, we've gone from... <laughs> and not your football team. Uh, uh, right. Well, <laughs> we've had that one for a while. Uh, uh. But, uh, <laughs> from, we've gone from a million eight to 700,000 people. And this, the trend you're seeing around the world of, of young people moving into urban areas is hitting us in a different way. And so you've got folks who lived here who are seeing Ford coming to town, putting $750 million into the train <coughs> station. You're seeing Dan Gilbert uh, putting $2 billion of buildings. If you saw the designs, they're good. they've broken ground on a 900-foot building. It'll be the tallest building in the country between Chicago and Philadelphia. And people who have been here said, that's all great, but what about me? Mm -hmm. And so we've put policies in place that says if we're giving you tax breaks on these kinds of projects, 51% of the hours worked on the construction will be by Detroit residents. Hmm. And our construction companies say, well, wait a minute, there's not enough plumbers and pipe fitters in Detroit. I said, I'm aware of that. And we're gonna come check your books every two weeks. And when you're short, 
you're going to make contributions to our workforce development plans. And so we've got a couple centers called Randolph and Brighthop, where we've put $20 million into training. We've now got hundreds of high school students learning skilled trades. And then when the students leave at 3 o'clock at night, hundreds of adults come in. And so we are hiring every Detroiter available, but we're training the future. And if you now walk into our plumber and carpenter apprenticeship classes and trades mm -hmm. have not been the most friendly to people of color over the years, you're now seeing 25, 30, 35 percent Detroiters. And so we're using the recovery to benefit our residents. Otherwise, it's, it's hard to understand why we ran for office, right? Yeah. Right. So talk a little bit about, uh, uh, let me stick with you for a minute here, because I mean, you know, in your last time I was in Detroit, we, we did a lunch. It's actually right near the train station. And there were people, neighborhood activists, talking about how they were gathering together themselves to repaint the crosswalks because the city was not you know, in position to even uh, conduct that kind of, uh, of maintenance. You had to deal with that restoration of basic city services. Sure. But now you can also focus more on these questions of recovery. And one of the things you have done is create this Department of Neighborhoods right. to try to spread the growth. Talk about what you've learned about what it takes to do that. Well, we've had... 30, 40,000 abandoned houses. But the interesting thing is in the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, people got underwater on their mortgages and they walked away from beautiful brick houses, houses that would be a million dollars in Seattle. People just walked away from. And so what we have done is, as we take down the burned out houses, every day on our website, buildingdetroit.org, we auction off four houses. Start at nine in the morning, go till five o'clock at night. Anybody's looking for a house? Uh, you can go on the website now. Uh, a lot of them go for $3,000. One last week went for $170,000. But we're filling in the vacant houses in the neighborhoods that can be saved. And as that's happening, it allows us to go to the storefronts that are vacant and say to businesses, hey, you moved out when people are moving out, come back in. And now we're revitalizing commercial quarters. And we're putting money into streetscapes. They're not painting mm. their own. Yeah. We're now putting in landscaped streetscapes mm. as we bring these corridors back. But we're doing it. We have 10 targeted neighborhoods because we got 140 square miles. But we are proving over and over the strategy is replicable. And the thing is, the people who stayed have seen their property values double. Uh, in the last four years, and, and I think they're feeling like we're headed the right direction. Yeah, Mayor, Mayor Durkin and, and then Mayor Carter, uh, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but when we go to cities, we often hear from advocates for low-income neighborhoods that not only are our kids not really on a track to compete for these new jobs, but the new people coming in create pressures of rising costs, and so it's kind of a double whammy. We're not benefiting from it on the, on the front end, and in many cases, we're being displaced on the back end. How do you deal with that? It's, it's an enormous challenge, uh, I think. And it is a problem of success in one sense of people coming in and investment coming in. But if longtime residents feel like all they are getting out of this growth is displacement, yeah, and I think you've improving. got to do both ends, right? You have to deal with the displacement gentrification <clears throat> itself to make sure people from those communities remain in those communities and have a home. And then you have to build the opportunity at the bottom level so that you're actually giving the kids the ability to earn the wages and have the opportunity so they can live any damn place in the city they want. So you have, on the front end, we've been doing an economic development initiative that really invests in those communities of color that are most likely to be displaced and subject to gentrification. So for example, we're funding housing and the rejuvenation of the Filipino Community Center and an area that was traditionally black in Seattle, an African-American neighborhood, is now mostly white. So we're funding a development called Africa Town to rejuvenate the commercial districts and residential districts in that house. So you, I think you have to do both ends. One is to have strategies for the displacement itself, but then if we're not providing the opportunity that's just a slow stopping. Mm -hmm. We've really got to provide that opportunity so there's the updraft part of the, uh, of the economic opportunity. Mayor Carter. Yeah, I think this is a function of a strategy of city building that has really prioritized building place over building people. And that, uh, gen that, that creates that gentrification phobia that you're talking about, where people actually don't want their neighborhoods mm -hmm. improved because they're worried that they'll get priced out of the neighborhood. The truth is, keeping our property taxes, keeping our values low isn't all that hard. If we all kick over our trash cans and spray paint profanities on the wall, we can do that. But that's not our goal. 
And our goal really is to invest. So we're trying to figure out how do we invest in people in a new way. Uh, traditionally speaking around the country, I would say most of our kind of anti-poverty work amounts to giving money to people who already have it, whether it's a developer or a big company to say, with the hope and intention that that money will make its way to jobs or housing for our lowest income residents. It's crazy that what I'm about to say is unique, but St. Paul is one of a number of cities that are saying, what if we take an anti-poverty uh, strategy that amounts to putting money directly back in the pockets of our lowest income residents. So we're working right now to raise the minimum wage in St. Paul. Uh, we're working to make sure that our residents are filing for their property taxes. We have about 5,000 families in St. Paul that are missing out on up to 12 to 15 million dollars in tax refunds every year just by not funding, not filing their returns. Uh, we're eliminating fees. We just eliminated late fees in our public library system uh, because we've got 51,000 library cards that are deactivated <coughs> for as little as $10 of late fees dating back to 2009. That was a really hard decision until we realized we actually Ooh. want children to read. And so... <laughs> And, 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 and we're also working, I always tell folks, the, the most exciting thing that we're doing is we're working uh, with uh, partners, the nonprofit, philanthropic, our co colleges, uh, to put $50 in the bank to start every child born in St. Paul on the pathway to college yeah. from birth. Well, we'll come back to that. Let me, let me ask about another kind of investment, though, which is um, in terms of business development. Where do you see the biggest bang for the buck? And this has really been brought into relief by the rather frenzied competition around the country for the Amazon mm -hmm. HQ2. Do you think it is more important to try to incent large companies to come to Detroit? Or is it more important to try to promote indigenous startups? Well, you know, in our situation, you know, our unemployment rate at 9% is half of what it was four years ago, but it's still yeah. double the rest of the country. And so one strategy isn't going to do it. And so we've been very successful at landing some significant manufacturing sites, Flex and Gate, uh, which is going to make most of the Ford Bronco. It's owned by Shad Khan, the owner of the cool. Jacksonville Jaguars, just opened a plant on the east side with 500 jobs, hiring a lot of folks from the neighborhood, good paying jobs to start. Uh, we've landed most of the bank headquarters, uh, Ally Bank, with 1,400 jobs. But we also have a program we call Motor City Match, for entrepreneurial startups. Every quarter with philanthropic funds, we give out $500,000 in grants, an average of $50,000 each. We get 300 companies Every quarter, prospective companies go into the competition, we pick the top 10, and they are overwhelmingly uh, entrepreneurs of color who are from the city of Detroit, and we're filling in the storefronts, building our entrepreneurial culture. And so, for us, it's going to take uh, all of these, and interestingly enough, we have an apparel industry that's mm -hmm. starting to emerge uh, here in the city with some good technology and a great entrepreneur. Given all your needs in Detroit, and that given the fact that Amazon at one point in September hit a market capitalization of one trillion, how did you feel about the prospect of significant tax incentives being offered? To them. So, so I mean, I, I mean, you're out of the competition. Yeah, Amazon, now. but but we did the same thing with Ford. They just uh -huh. agreed to bring 5,000 people, and so you, is I've that got, the price of I've, that? I've got a train station that has been empty yeah. and is a symbol of blight in Detroit for 30 mm. years. Ford, in their plan, is going to pay us 400 million dollars in taxes over the next 30 years. I strike a deal that they're going to pay us 300 million dollars in taxes for the vacant building instead of 400 million to bring uh, 5,000 jobs. That, to me, was a no-brainer, which is why it passed with enormous community support. I, I I'm interested in your, I'm going to get to Mayor Durkin in a minute, but your thought, do you feel as though cities are being played off each other at a time when they have their own needs that, that might be a better use of some of these uh, incentive funds? Often, yes. I think it ends up being something of a false question because the large companies and the smaller startups end up being part of an ecosystem that works, that has to work mm -hmm. really well together. Right now, in the Twin Cities metro area, for every 10 job openings we have, we only have eight job seekers. And so, you know, our investment, uh, I think, upstream of saying how do we bring in an Amazon HQ2 or how do we bring in another, uh, when we talk about bringing in large employers, some of our businesses get concerned because they, uh, mm -hmm. they can't fill the job openings they have right now. So one of our big things, and I think the paradox of cities, the paradox of work right now, we were having a conversation about this yesterday, is the, all the people who are unemployed in our communities uh, and all of the companies who can't, find, uh, who can't find talent in our communities and figuring out how to play sort of the matching game between the two. Let, let's come back to that. Mayor, Mayor Durkin, let me ask you, I mean, you, you're sitting on Amazon HQ1, so I'm wondering what your advice would be to whichever city ultimately wins this competition. What should they be thinking about? I They're think the first thing is I'm opposed to HQ2. Mm -hmm. 
I think you should tell them to stay where they are. Um, look, I think that it is a tremendous, it's been, it has changed the face of Seattle. There's no question about it. You know, we have 50,000 Amazon workers in the city of Seattle and they decided to locate in the urban city itself. And it's changed the complexion of Seattle. So I would say is make sure you got housing stock because the affordability in Seattle went through the roof, which puts such compression mm. on not just our middle class, but added to that displacement and gentrification in a way that no one was ready for. And all the other infrastructure challenges, our transportation systems weren't ready, our social services systems weren't ready, so we have a significant homeless problem. Um, and so all of those things to build the city of the future, if you can have as much of it ready as possible, because to retrofit a city, is really hard. Um, I would also say is, I think that we are in this moment in time that is more displacing than the industrial revolution. And we're seeing this new economy take off, but we can't lose sight of that old economy jobs and really focus, if you've got great manufacturing jobs, for example, or great building trades, figure out how you keep those and build those, keep those pipelines going, because those jobs offer a type of employment that is different and as important to a city as these tech jobs, which are much more subject to kind of changes in the economy. Let me, let me stick with you there, because you mentioned the homelessness, and you, I think you, you've, Seattle has had one of the most interesting and revealing recent municipal confrontations, where one of the ways you tried to respond to that homeless and affordability challenge was a head tax on large employers that the city council passed and then had to repeal under intense backlash from those large employers. What are the lessons you took from that about the extent to which cities and their businesses are really rowing in the same direction? I think you've not only got by rowing the direction, but I think that that battle was as much a reflection of people in Seattle were discomforted by, they didn't know whether there was a place for them in the future. So the fight in Seattle was as much about the um, displacement and un the economic uncertainty of the middle class as it was about the head tax. And also, I think that government is not trusted by the people. Mm -hmm. We're in this time where governments are constantly being um, criticized and eroded. And so if you can't show the people that you're spending the money well, they will doubt it. And that was what really rang true with people. It was not just the tax on business, which mm. most people supported. It was, we think you have enough money already. Why, aren't you, why can't you fix the problem? Uh, but you are, as you said, you, you, you are on the brink, I think, of passing yes. a property tax levy that would fund expanded opportunity pipeline, really, from preschool through years 13 and 14. So let me ask, I'm going to ask Mayor Carter and Mayor Duggan, is that something, uh, you know, we, there are a number of more affluent cities that have funded their own universal pre-K. Seattle, where the construction crane might as well be the state bird. That's right. Uh, or, and Denver, and Austin, and New York. Is it plausible for the broad range of American cities to take that on themselves, funding pre-K, funding guaranteed access to community college, or is that something that ultimately, uh, to be widely available, will need to be funded by a higher level of government? I'd say yes to both. I mean, cities uh, and leaders in cities, it's, an, it's no secret in this room, uh, stand up and speak up and, and, and fund and face issues uh, that are national and statewide and regional issues, uh, but in the vacuum of leadership at the federal level uh, and in too many of our state capitals, yes, cities have to act to be able to do that. We're doing things like that in our, ourselves as well to fund early childhood. 95% of brain development occurs before age five. That renders an education system that starts at age six uh, obsolete. And we have to be able to, willing to stand up and make investments where that's concerned. It would be better if our state capitals and our, and our federal government would invest to help us out. But in the absence of that leadership, yes, we, have, we can't so, not act. So it's interesting in your assumption that we haven't done it. Yeah. Uh, no, no, not that, the way, not that you haven't done it. And the yeah. interesting thing is the city of Detroit became the first major city yeah. in America to guarantee two years of community college for every yeah. high school graduate. We have it today. It's called the Detroit uh, Promise. Uh, and we take a little piece of the growth in the property taxes every year and is set aside in a fund. Uh, and if you get a 3.0 in high school and a 21-year ACT, we've got 12 universities you're guaranteed four years education. So as I say to folks, if you put your house up for sale in the city of Detroit, you ought to put a sign on it that says, with this house comes a free college education. Uh, we are moving, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, yeah. but we will very shortly, I think, have a universal uh, pre-K uh, for four-year-olds in place. But these things, when they're targeted right, 
are, are not as expensive as they seem, uh, and it's a big advantage right now. People now know if you graduate from high school in Detroit, college is paid mm -hmm. for. You graduate from high school in the suburbs, it's not, and it's become a competitive advantage for us. You know, one thing I yeah. would also say is when mayors lead, others follow. Uh -huh. So for example, the city of Seattle, if we pass this, I have mayors around the region now saying, we want in. They may not be able to afford it, so they're putting pressure on the state legislature for them to fund it. So I think in this time of change, you know, we're not getting leadership from Washington, D.C. Some of us can't get it from the states. Mayors have to lead, and if we lead, we can set the tempo. Yeah, each of you are dealing in various ways with the issue of the minimum wage. You've proposed an increase, the state is debating what to do here, you have an increase. Talk about the, the minimum wage in a broader opportunity strategy. You know, just at the core of, as a core value, people who work full time shouldn't be stuck raising their children in poverty. Uh, that's something that we've committed ourselves to as a value. It's something that I committed myself to on the campaign trail and that our city actually, I ran, I won last year and every candidate for mayor uh, in our, every major candidate was committed to raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. So that's something that we're doing. Uh, our city council will actually be having a pu their public hearing on our ordinance uh, next week. Uh, and so we're looking forward to getting that passed into law before the end of the year. Uh, what What's been actually surprising is the extent to which our business community has uh, really understood, and we've had you know big conversations about some of the details within the ordinance. Uh, but uh, the extent to which our business community has really understood and said this really makes sense because they see themselves uh, facing you know turnover and some of the competitiveness challenges uh, that requires raising the wages, anyways. You know the fact that we're in this building right. is just reflective of the fact that there is a a, a, a campaign going on to try to get to ten dollars an hour. Uh, so, so I want, and I want to thank everybody. So in, in Michigan, our legislature passed a law that prohibits any local community mm -hmm. from establishing its own minimum wage. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, there's been significant momentum. And about a month ago, the janitorial unions on the downtown office buildings all got uh, a contract that'll get them to $15 within three years with the support of the community. Uh, and over at the Westin Book Cadillac, where this event was planned to be started, uh, you had a group that's out on strike. And I want to thank everybody for being respectful of that and moving the conference here. Um, but there's a lot of wealth being built in this country, and I support the, the minimum wage by law, but I also support the responsible uh, companies, including uh, your uh, company, Amazon, that just yeah. went to $15. Yep. Uh, minimum wage. J.P. Morgan's going to a $15 minimum wage. There's been a lot of debate in Seattle, I mean, dueling studies. What do you think the impact has been of the $15? I think it's positive, but I think the next phase we have to do is we've got to couple it with portable benefits. If you look mm. at the gig economies and, and underpaid people, we've got to make sure not just we're paying $15 an hour in living wage, but if you don't have portable benefits and people are the ability to build wealth, to help health insurance, we're going to be in the, it, we're just buying the trouble later down the road, and you've got to match it with affordable housing and good transportation. Yeah. Uh, let me try to squeeze in one more area. We have an administration now that may be uniquely disconnected from urban America. Uh, Trump lost 87 of the 100 largest counties in America, lost them by over 15 million combined votes. If you look at his travel log for the campaign, you can see where he thinks his, his base is. What is the impact of the administration policies on your ability to create opportunity in your community? And where could, if, where could the federal government be more helpful if it was inclined to be? Where could the federal government be more helpful? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, How much time oh, do are we they have? helping? Yeah. You, uh, you have two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere. Everywhere. Um, you know, we have serious challenges in our community right now. You know, we're talking about housing. We're talking about poverty. We're talking about inequality. We're talking about disparities in our communities. We're talking about people feeling disaffected by government. Those things are really critical. And those things are making people feel threatened. They're making people feel uh, isolated. They're making people feel desperate in a lot of ways. It's having a bookend effect on us because uh, I think people's level of disillusion with the federal government has never been higher, uh, not in my lifetime, uh, but also their uh, willingness to look to cities or willingness to look to local leaders and really invest sweat equity in the local level has never been higher. So that's an opportunity. If they wanted to help, what could they do? Opioid. We, we are, our behavior health and opioid, we, we are not getting funding we need to help people. And that's been cut off. The second thing is Seattle is trade sensitive. So the sanctions with mm. China, that's driving up the cost of steel, driving up building costs, it's hurting our ports on trade. So I think that there's not a lot of thought about, you know, when we take these actions in the federal government, both what they're doing that can hurt and the ways that city actually need help. So housing and behavioral health dollars would help cities enormously. Yeah. Solve this immigration fight. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, we, were, we were benefiting enormously uh, from uh, the immigration under the Obama administration, Bangladeshi community, Yemeni community, a uh, number of Latino uh, communities, et cetera. And I was a national speaker for President Obama taking the, the Syrian refugees. It has slowed to a trickle, and it has, it has hurt Detroit's recovery. And I wish the Republicans and Democrats in Washington would come together once and for all and solve this issue. Well, I think we... I think we can all agree our three mayors have given us a great way to start this day. So thank you all very right. much. Thank you. Mayor. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Good to see you.